Good morning. Good morning. How are you, new song? Good. If you're, are you feeling like me a little slow this morning? Is it the heat or is it all the turkey you had this week? <laughs> um, might be both. That's right. Um, so good morning. Do we have any first-time visitors here today? Woo! Good to have you. Thanks for visiting. Ushers, if you'll make sure they got a connect card. We're so happy you're here today. Um, make sure you reach out and greet our first-time visitors. My name is Delissa. If you don't know, I'm the outreach minister here at the church. And I am um, excited to be bringing a word to you today. It's been a great month, right? We're finishing off our missions month, and we heard a great word from Pastor Barbara on week one about how do you smell. And she was talking about the fra fragrance we give off when we live our lives for Jesus. And do we bring the smell of death or life? And then in week two, we had Pastor Reggie, and he showed up not even knowing what Pastor Barbara had spoke about the week before, and he started talking about the crushing and how when we're crushed, the oils bring out fragrance and how the sweet smell of Christ working in our lives only comes through trials and being pressed. And he shared with us some of the work and missions work he's been doing in the South Bronx and some of the trials him and his wife have been encountering. And last week, we had the pleasure of having Lisa Washington here who shared about her mission for the sanctity of life as she works with Love Life. And she shared how God is with us in our suffering and in our pain. This week, we're closing out on our month of missions. And I wanted to talk to you about living a life on mission. The title of my sermon today is Mission Possible. What is our mission? Well, Mark 16, 15 says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Matthew 28, verse 18 and 19 says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The mission has been and will always be about telling others you see, when you have an encounter with Jesus, it's not just about you, it's bigger. And I love how here at New Song, we follow our month of encounter with a month on missions. Remember the story about the man who was freed from the demons? In Luke chapter 8, verse 38 and 39, the man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. Mark wrote it this way in chapter 5, verse 19. Go home to, all, to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. Even the Samaritan woman that met Jesus at the well after her encounter with Jesus, she told her entire town and they made their way toward him. But where did she go first? She went home. This is because the mission is much bigger than one woman and one man. It's much bigger than you or me. It's about salvation for eternity that is offered to all humanity. Today, you might be overwhelmed by all that has been said on missions this month. And you might actually be thinking that the mission is impossible. I assure you that the mission is possible, but probably not in the way you're thinking, because you're probably thinking about Mark chapter 10, verse 27. It says, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Amen. And possible in this context means able to be done or achieved. This verse literally says, God is able. And when I started preparing for this sermon, I assure you, that I wanted to go this direction with this. I wanted to come to you this morning and be like, God is able to take care of all of your needs. And trust me, He is able to take care of all your needs. And the mission is definitely possible with Him. But I was actually led during my study to this scripture, and it's going to be the focus of our time today. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22. To the weak, I became weak, 
to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. The word possible in this verse is an adjective, and it means as much, quickly, or as soon as something can be done. The King James Version puts it this way, I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Church, would you pray with me this morning? Lord, I love you and I thank you. Lord, I pray that my words would be your words. Lord, open our eyes and our hearts, Lord, to what you have for us today, Father Lord. Lord, speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, we need to remember that we have been given a mission. You've heard both Pastor Barbara and Pastor Reggie both say that they are, that when you are a Christian, you're on the mission field, like it or not. The mission is great and overwhelming, and yes, our God is able and all things are possible through Him, but we must do our part. And when I say do our part, I mean by all means possible. Yes. As much, as quickly, and as soon as can be done. So how do you live a life on mission? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> but first, I kind of wanted to get us all in the mood, and so I have this short little video to share with you. Jesus. It's your children, your family, your friends, your neighbors. It's the world in which each of you live. And we have been given an ops plan. It's right here. It's the word of God. Joshua 1.8 says, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. We all want a successful mission, right? We don't want the mission to fail. But my question to you is, when is the last time you thought about the people in your life that don't know Jesus, and you actually thought about how you could show them the love of Jesus? Pastor Barbara's message earlier this month touched on this. When making a plan, we need God's vision. We need His word, and we need to spend time in prayer so we can hear His voice guiding us. 
Proverbs 16.3 says, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and He will establish your plans. This goes hand in hand with discipline. Spending time in the Word and in prayer requires discipline. I mean, how many of you are just like so excited every day to jump out of bed and get in the Word and spend some time in prayer? I mean, it's kind of like going to the gym. It's not our favorite thing generally. It requires discipline. When you watch a movie and the main character is, character is given a mission, the next thing the, normally, the movie normally will show you is that they're working out, they're eating properly, they're getting ready for the battle ahead. And we have to do the same. You see, our battle is different. It's spiritual. But don't for one minute think that you're going to live a life on mission and you're not going to have battles. There will be battles and they will be fierce. You must prepare. If you don't, the mission will fail before it ever begins. Benjamin Franklin once said that failing to plan is planning to fail. Discipline prepares us for the battle, but it also is the foundation of our message. I want you to listen to that again. Discipline prepares us for the battle, but it also is the foundation of our message. Pastor Reggie explained to us a couple weeks ago that if we live one way and talk another, our children will see that, and they won't necessarily live the way we tell them to, but they will live the way we show them to. This is so true in so many areas of our lives, but none more than with our children. Because our children see us in almost every aspect. They see us on Sundays at church, and they see us Monday mornings when we are running late, and they see us on Wednesday evenings when we are driving in traffic and someone cuts us off. And on Thursdays when they bring home a failing grade from school. And on Friday nights when we're too tired or too busy to spend time with them. And they see us on Saturdays at the ball game when the ref makes a bad call. And they see us again on Sunday when we decide not to go because it's been a rough week. You see, they see it all. They see us. And so do so many others that are in our lives. Believe it or not, people are watching you. And it's our discipline, our actions in our everyday lives that will speak louder than any words. I'm going to speak a lot today in terms of parents and their children for several reasons. If you guys don't know, I have a lot. <laughs> Actually, that is true, but I, that's not why I'm going to talk about that relationship in particular. It's because I believe our first mission is our home. That's right. It's our children. It's those we live with. That is our first mission. What does it say about me if I go out and win the world? What does it say about me if I'm here today giving the message to you, but I don't share it with my family at home? Mm. One of my favorite quotes is from Mother Teresa. She said, if you want to change the world, go home and love your family. I want all of you in heaven with me one day, but more than anything in the world, I want my kids in heaven with me. I want my family in heaven with me. The second reason I'm talking about this is because parents, you are the leader of your home. Well, you should be. Let me repeat that. Parents, you are the leader of your home. The relationship you have with your child is like any other and that you are given automatic leadership. If you are a parent in this room, repeat after me. Say, I am the leader. I can't hear you. I am the leader. First Timothy chapter three, verses four and five says, Give the that it gives the qualifications of an overseer or a deacon in a church, and one of them is that they must manage their own family well and see that their children obey. This means that before anyone should become a leader within a church, you must first learn how to lead your own family. Parents, you are called to be leaders in your home. Your most important mission and responsibility are those in your home and most particularly your children. I'm gonna to touch more on this later, but I think so many times when we start talking about missions, the furthest thing from our minds is our own families. Don't forget, Jesus sent the man delivered from demons back to his home. 
The mission also requires, the mission requires discipline and planning, but you must consider that the mission has a cost. This is point two. The mission has a cost. It can be financial, physical, or relational. Jesus put it this way in Luke chapter 14 and verse 28. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? For years and years, Christians have given their lives so that the mission would be fulfilled, that the gospel would be spread. Ten of the disciples are believed to have died for that mission. If it were not for their sacrifice, we would not have the gospel we have today. And yet, many still give their lives on a daily basis for the cause of Christ. Missionaries leave their families to go to foreign countries. Christians around the world are persecuted for their faith. And yet, the gospel continues to be spread. It's interesting to me that we don't really hear about those things here in America. You don't see it on the news, but it happens every day. What is the cost for us here that we may not be... What is the cost for us here that may not be called to go, but we are called missionaries right where we are planted? Have you ever asked yourself, what am I really willing to give? If you consider the question seriously, it can be telling. Are you willing to give money, family, reputation, possessions, friends, comfort, time, health, your life? I assure you there is no better place to be in life than fully living your God-given purpose. And I assure you that includes living on mission, spreading the love of Jesus. But there is always a cost. When you enter the call to live a life of mission, you count the cost. You take the leap and you don't look back. When I think of looking back, Lot's wife comes to mind. But to really understand this story in context, you have to go all the way back to Abraham. Remember, Abraham is visited by three visitors. And they tell him that Sarah is going to have a child at the same, around that time the following year. And as they're leaving, you see this interesting conversation God is having with himself in Genesis chapter 18 and verse 17. He says, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. I want you to note that God says he specifically chose Abraham so that he would direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. Remember what I talked about? Parents, you're the leader of your home. And this verse says that God chose Abraham so he would direct his children to continue following him. Abraham's first mission was his family. You see, God told Abraham that after this verse that he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. The cities were wicked. And Abraham begins to plead for Sodom. Why does he plead for Sodom? His family is there. And Abram's like, God, if there's 50 righteous men, will you please save the city? And he goes all the way down to 10, because he's desperate. I mean, you got to think about the urgency of this. There's desperation. He's pleading for his family. God, if there's just 10 people in the city, will you save it? You see, his nephew was there in Sodom. And so God sends an angels into the city to save Lot and his family. They tell him that he has to leave the city. Or it's going to be destroyed. And you see in the, in the verses that Lot's son-in-laws, they're making fun of him. They're laughing at him. I mean, this city is so wicked. We're not going to go into how wicked it was, but it was a wicked place. And I imagine in my mind this chaotic moment where Lot is trying to save his family. You have Abraham pleading to God for his family. You have Lot trying to rescue and get his family out of the city. Salvation was theirs if they would just leave. A future was theirs if they would just leave. It was all thanks to Abraham and his plea for mercy that God had given them a plan. And yet when considering the cost, 
Lot's wife looks back. She couldn't let go of what she thought she had. It was the same for the rich young ruler in Luke chapter 18, verses 22 and 23. He couldn't sell his possessions and give them to the poor. Jesus said, come, follow me. Jesus gave him a direct invitation. Come, follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. You might not think that you are very wealthy, but I challenge you to consider that you are richer than most of the world. There are many statistics that indicate that the poorest of the poor in America are more wealthy than the majority of the world. They say that if you make $10,000 a year here in America, you are more wealthy than 84% of the rest of the world. We forget living in America how blessed we are. We are so blind to the reality of the world, and yet when we consider the cost, we're not sure if it's worth it. What is the cost to us here in America? It's certainly not death or prison. The cost might be our reputation. It might be our relationships. It might be money. This is one of the reasons I think every person should at least once in their life go on a missions trip. Not to any country, but to a third world country. Not because you desperately need to go and do amazing things in India and Africa. That's not why you need to go. But because it will change your heart. You will see the world differently. And you will understand that yes, there is a cost. But there is also so much more. The rich young ruler and Lot's wife, they could not understand yet that yes, there is a cost. But the mission is worth so much more. And the reason they didn't understand that is because they didn't understand the urgency. A church, quite frankly, a church here, we, we quite frankly don't understand the urgency either. If we did, there wouldn't be an empty seat in this room. We would live differently. We would live with purpose and with urgency. You don't need a cancer diagnosis or a death sentence to know that. Ten out of ten of us are going to die one day. That's 100% of us. That's, right. That's not the question. The question is, where are you and your children and your friends and your co-workers and your neighbors? Where are they going to spend eternity? Yep. Point three is the mission is urgent. Satan is so good at what he does. He makes sin look good. He appeases our wants and our desires to comfort us into a complete comatose state. I mean, we have all seen it. The world can be falling apart. Kids screaming and crying, all heaven breaking loose. And there in the midst of all that chaos, there's someone. Wait a minute. There's someone lost in their phone. They're not aware of anything that's going around them, even the danger around them. And we're all guilty. I'm guilty. I've been on my phone and my kids have come in the room and they're telling me a story and I don't hear a single word they said and they're like, Mom, Mom, did you hear what I said? And I'm like, wait, oh, I'm sorry. I totally didn't even hear you. I'm just as guilty. You know, it's funny to me that all the way back to the beginning of time, we have fallen for the lie. Mm -hmm. Satan told Eve she would gain wisdom if she ate the forbidden fruit. I want you to really think about this. Eve wanted what she couldn't have. She wanted that which looked good. And she wanted knowledge. Fast forward to today, and most of our time is spent on our phones, and we're looking at that which we can't have, that which looks good, and what we think is knowledge. The Bible talks about this thirst for knowledge and the end times in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. He says, but you, Daniel, roll up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. In 2 Timothy 3, chapters, um, chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, 
disobedient to their parents, ungrateful. It goes on and on, but down to verse 7, it says, always learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Church, we must wake up. The mission is urgent. I mean, when watching Mission Impossible, the whole world will be destroyed if Ethan Hunt doesn't complete the mission, right? And we can be at the edge of our seats at the movies watching this, and we're just so into it, right? And here we are in a real-world real stage critical in our lives, and we are too busy on Pinterest or TikTok to even care. Listen, I'm not against Pinterest or TikTok. That's not what this message is about. But this message is about that we have been lulled to sleep, church. If you are here today and you are not a Christian, meaning you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, and if you are a Christian, you should know, but let me reiterate, heaven and hell are very real. Jesus is coming back for his church for those that know him and have accepted him as their savior. And not a single one of us knows when that day will happen. But based on what we do know, it could be any day. Mm -hmm. See, we're talking about mission possible. And remember, that meant by any means, as much, as quickly, or as soon as something can be done. When we live our life on mission, we live with an urgency. We have to grasp that we are talking about heaven or hell. And although many like to sing and joke about the highway to hell, there's not going to be much singing or joking if you actually go there. To put this in perspective, what would you do if your family was trapped in a burning building and you were outside? Or what would you do if your child got lost in the woods or they were abducted by somebody and held for ransom? Could you just take a brief minute and think about the urgency, the sheer terror that would come inside of you. All of a sudden, your money, your possessions, your time, your reputation, they no longer matter. Who cares about Pinterest or TikTok when you are facing a life or death situation? They no longer have value. I'm not going to Google how to save my parents from a burning building, am I? No. I'm not going to look to someone on TikTok to negotiate a ransom for my child. No, instead I become the crazy mother or the crazy family member who does whatever it takes, contacts whoever has authority, I leave my possessions, I leave my job, I do whatever it takes to save the life of my family member. Amen? Amen. And we must live with that same urgency when it comes to our family and our children and their walk with God. 1 Peter 1 and 5 says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Luke 12, 40 says, You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Look, at the end of the day, I can't make the choice for others. Not for my kids, not for my friends. It's their choice and their decision. But I assure you, I will plan, I will pray, I will live a disciple life because the crazy mom slash friend who won't quit talking about God, no matter the cost, so that those around me, by whatever means possible, will have their own encounter with Jesus and become followers of Him. That's what's important. Satan wants me to stay tired. He wants me to relax in front of the TV and ignore the signs of trouble in my own home. But I must stay vigilant. I can't allow the things of this world or what I perceive to be the loss of those things prevent me from doing that which is more valuable. The mission is urgent. Finally and most importantly, the mission requires intentionality. Your plan will be different for different people in your life and how you might show them Jesus. We are all uniquely different and we experience Jesus differently based on the different experiences we have encountered in our life. I mean, you can tell your child to go to church, but you can't necessarily tell your friend they have to go to church, right? That you're going to handle things differently. Remember the parable of the sower? Some people in our lives are like the path. They have been trampled on along with any seed. 
that may be planted. Maybe they need someone to care about their basic needs and love them by giving provision. Some people are like rocky ground, and when the plant grows, they wither for lack of moisture. Maybe they need someone to see beyond the hard places in their life and offer genuine concern and tenderness before any seeds can grow. You see, planting seeds or living a life on mission does not mean standing on the street corner yelling repent. That's not what I'm talking about. It's tending to the soil so that when the seed is planted, it can grow. You may not know, but I'm really a farm girl. And growing up, we had gardens bigger than the plaza out front here. We had, um, we had fields where wheat and cotton grew further than the eye could see. So I learned a little bit about soil and crops along the way. One thing I know is that if the soil goes bad, if it lacks the nourishment it needs, if it's overworked, if it doesn't get any moisture, it won't produce. It doesn't matter what type of seed you plant, it won't produce a good crop if you don't tend to the soil. How you tend to the soil depends on what it needs. And the farmer must be intentional with how he tends the soil. Church, we must be intentional with how we tend the soil or the lives of those around us. The mission requires us to be intentional. You see, you have been given the authority to speak into your children's lives just by who you are as their parent. But others in your life, you have to earn the right to speak into. You have to tend the soil, grow the relationship, become a friend or a person of discipline and integrity before you can plant that seed. It's all of it, all of it is part of the mission. For a moment though, Today, I would like to focus on bringing this life on mission into your home as parents. As parents, you know there are all kinds of parenting methods. The helicopter method, the kid-centric method, there is like a million different methods out there. And Dustin and I, that's my husband Dustin and I, we were watching this show called The Parent Test. I don't know if any of you ever saw it, but it was so interesting. Because they took kids that were raised by all these different methods of parenting and they put them in various scenarios. Like, they would leave them alone in a candy shop and tell them not to eat any candy. I mean, what kid is not going to do that, right? But based on the way the parents had parented them, they were seeing how they would react in these scenarios. And look, I'm not an expert on parenting, just so you know. In fact, probably many of the experts would tell me that my methods are crazy. But over the years and five kids, Dustin and I have adopted the method of parenting with intentionality. You see, no two kids are the same for us or for you. And we have to consider the needs of each child. But we also have to consider the goal or the change that we want to see occur in their life and parent accordingly based on who they are. So I wanna look at this in terms of parenting on mission. Our goal or mission is that our children will have their own personal encounter with Jesus and that they will become fully devoted followers of him, living their own life of mission and purpose. How does this happen? happen? Well, we are intentional and here are a few ways. The first way is we build a team. Have you ever heard the phrase, it takes a village? Yep. It does. And ours starts right here at church. Yep. Is going to school optional? No. no. Is brushing your teeth optional? I sure hope not. <laughs> <laughs> then neither is going to church. Right. Your children will not learn, grow, or meet Jesus in most, most circumstances outside of your church or your home. If church is optional to you, then church will become non-existent to your child. It was at church where I met people who loved Jesus, taught me how to pray, and it is where I learned to love Jesus and have my own relationship with Him. Is this church full of humanity that can be messy and hypocritical and hurtful? Absolutely. And no one knows that better than a pastor's child. You want to know why? Because they see everything. But that is why we teach our kids to follow Jesus and not humans. 
They learn how to love and forgive, and they do learn that no one, no Christian, not anybody is perfect. And your child can learn the same. I know I might get a lot of pushback after this about this particular point, and I'll be happy to talk to you after service. But I challenge you to set the example first and be the leader in your child's life. Make church a priority. If you make church a priority, when your son gets his first internship in, Pittsburgh, in, in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, he'll call you and he'll say, Mom and Dad, could you come help me find a church? And we'll leave church and we'll go spend a weekend with him looking for a church. There's nothing better than that when they're out on their own and they're seeking God for themselves. So make church a priority. Remember the ops plan I mentioned at the beginning? Remember, it's your Bible, it's the Word. Part of the ops plan that you have when you're doing a, a mission, a military or a law enforcement mission, is it lists all the team members that are involved in a mission. When you watch any Mission Impossible type movie, there's always a team, right? It has the guy with the big muscles. He has no brains, but he has the muscles. And then there's the brains, right? They're the ones that are hacking into the computer system. And then there's the hero, he saves the day, or she saves the day. So there's a team that makes the mission successful. They need all of those things, right, to make the mission successful. And as parents, we have to be intentional about the team that we place around our children, the team that we become a part of, because that team becomes the team that supports our children. And speaking of teams, we have one of the best teams here at Newsom. If you guys think we have a picture of that team, they make it happen every week, and there's not a better team to have surround your kids than a team made up of individuals who are willing to sacrifice for the mission. These people learn they love your children, and they make them a part of their lives, and they're good people that can speak into your children's lives. And I'm so glad we get to honor this team on December 9th. But in addition to your church family, be relentless in pl placing people and getting resources that will point the way to Jesus in your child's life. Be careful who you place as an authority figure or allow to become an authority figure. Be careful of counselors who may not believe the way you believe. Ask questions, push back, and know who and what is being spoken into their lives. You have to fight, parents about who has leadership in your children's lives. The second thing we do is we make God a part of our everyday life. We make talking about God a normal part of our everyday conversation. We bring God into our everyday life so much so that when our kids want to talk about it, they will be comfortable talking to us about it. Don't make it out of reach or holier than thou or make it all kinds of weird. Just make it open, honest, and relational. When I mess up or I have a bad day, I want my kids to know I'm struggling, but that God is my strength. There are some Sundays, let's just get real, right, and honest. There are some Sundays when I don't feel like coming here and serving. I've had a hard week too, but I let my kids see that because I want them to know that on some days they don't feel like they want to be here either. I want to let them see me pushing through and we rejoice together when good things happen here at New Song. We talk about it. We talk about God and what he's doing in our church and what he's doing in the lives of our family members. And we pray together and we talk about the sermons and we ask questions and we let them question God. It's okay, and it's part of the process. We have to learn to embrace and allow our children to talk openly about God. One thing we never do is we never shy away from the truth. We always bring them back to the truth. They can question, they can tell us how they're feeling, but then we always bring them back to the truth. Finally, and most importantly, we battle through prayer. 
mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, whoever you are in the life of a child. They need you to pray. You see, the battle is spiritual. It's not you against them as much as you might feel like it is. The devil wants their soul. Yep. And in order to do battle in a way that matters, you have to learn to pray. This goes all the way back to discipline. You have to learn to pray. I cannot tell you the number of times I felt discouraged about my kids. It's a terrible feeling. It's absolutely the worst feeling to watch them wander away from God. There have been times when I didn't even know what the issue was. You see, as much as we love and are involved with our kids, we can never see in their hearts. But God does. There have been times when I knew my kids were going through something and they wouldn't share it with me, and I've prayed that God would reveal it. And He has. Sometimes I wished I hadn't found out, to be honest, because it was painful. It was ugly. But God will always reveal if you earnestly seek Him. I'm sure my kids think that I've hired spies that follow their every move. We've always joked about it. But the, real, the reality is I have no spies. I just know the one who sees all. When God has revealed the issues that my kids are dealing with in their lives, then I have to pray for direction. It doesn't just end with revelation, right? You have to pray for direction. You see, I believe everything you need to know to parent is in the Bible and through prayer. One last note on this. When your kids are dealing with something and you seek God for direction, follow through. Yep. Don't pretend like the problem doesn't exist or it will get better on its own. It won't. Step up and be the leader in your home. I know how easy it is to hide things or to pretend like they don't exist. But the reality is I would much rather my children face what they're dealing with while they're under the protection of my umbrella. Amen. It's going to be ten times harder if you let it go and they have to deal with it later as an adult. You see, your children need discipline and guidance and you need to be intentional through prayer and how that should be done. Because they are your first mission. Amen. No matter who your mission field is, you must be intentional. There has never been a time in history when that is more true. Do you know today you can send your child to a Christian college and they will teach you that the Bible is not 100% true, that salvation is what you decide for yourself that it is. In today's world, there's all kinds of thoughts and theories and it usually revolves around you and how you want it to be. The truth has become a lie and the lie has become truth. How do you reach a world that is so lost? Well, you accept the mission. You decide in your heart that you will become all things to all people so that by all possible means you might lead them to salvation. These are the words that Paul wrote to the church of Corinthians after his first visit. This is what Paul did when he accepted the call. Paul understood that all things to all people by any possible means meant that it would take discipline and planning. He would need to count the cost. He needed to understand the urgency and he needed to be intentional to fulfill his mission. He went on to send another letter to the church of Corinth, which is our theme verse this month. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 15. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. And he goes on in verse 16, he says, To the one we are an aroma that brings death, to the other an aroma that brings life. And who is equal to such a task? Are you equal to such a task? Will you accept the mission by any means possible? My husband Dustin and I, we have lived a life on mission for the majority of our 24 years of marriage. While preparing for this message, I was reminded of a moment in 2018. We were leading a missions trip in St. Croix. It was a mission trip that I was not supposed to be on and I didn't want to be on it. I was struggling 
And it was on that trip that I decided to tell my husband that I no longer wanted to live a life on mission. I thought the cost had been too much. I still wanted to follow Jesus. I believed everything about him, but I was just tired. I felt like we had given our all, and we had been hurt and disappointed. And here we were, away from our kids on a mission trip that was supposed to have been someone else's responsibility, and nobody cared, and I could go on and on. You've been there, right? Life was unfair. The cost had been great, and I was unhappy. And just so you know, my husband, he's my rock, and he's always got my back. But he is not one to have a pity party with you, if you know what I mean. And although he was hurting just as much as I was, he said to me, that's it? You're going to quit? Well, you can quit if you want to, but I'm not. And guess what? That was not what I wanted to hear. I wanted to hear him agree with me and tell me how wrong everyone else was and how we were done. So I just went down to the ocean. We were in St. Croix, guys. And I sat on a hammock that God had planted there just for me that day. And I started crying to God. And I let him start working in the depths of my heart because the truth was, I was focused on the hurt. I was focused on others. I was focused on the cost and not on eternity. I forgot that we were called to be an aroma that brings life. I'm not the savior, no one gets saved because of me, but I am called to lead others to the one who does by any means possible because God is more than able. And while I was in St. Croix, I purchased this hook bracelet that I'm wearing. It's supposed to be a symbol of love and unity, but for me, it became my acceptance of the mission. You see, I wore this bracelet every day for almost three years, and I still wear it many days. And every morning when I put it on, it symbolizes to me, because it has a hook that you hook, your hook on. It symbolizes that I'm hooking myself onto God. It was through his power and strength that I would live my life on mission that day and every day to come, no matter the cost. You see, three months after that trip to St. Croix, my family walked into New Song Church. We had been through a battle, and we were bruised, but God had another mission for our family, and it was here at New Song, and we said yes. And that was five years ago. And I'm so thankful that God brought us here. But it's funny, God is still using what happened five years ago for his glory because I was thinking of this bracelet when I was writing this sermon. And I decided to order bracelets for all of you today, not these cool ones, but these silicone bracelets like this. Because I thought like it would be a great way for you guys to um, remember the message but what's funny is, I realized that God wanted you to use this bracelet to tell others about Him. See, over the past few weeks, Cooper and I have been sharing about how school's been going. And he was sharing with me about how he's been wearing these silicone bracelets. Apparently, they're the cool thing right now. I thought they weren't that cool, but... Um, he, you know, he's been collecting the Love Life. They had the Love Life ones, but he has all these different bracelets with memory verses. And he says that the kids at his school, they ask him about them. And all the ones he has are like Christian. So he shares with them what it means. And then he finds out that he's not the only Christian in his school. And he starts inviting kids to youth group. And who would have known that just by wearing a bracelet, God opened the door for teenagers in a New York City public school. And he's been adding bracelets, and we've been talking about it, and he's super excited. He's going to be all embarrassed, but he told me he was super excited about getting this bracelet today. But you know what I'm excited about? I'm excited that he's being intentional about his mission. So before you leave, make sure you grab a bracelet. Our ushers will have them in the back.
Worship team, if you could please come up. The mission is still the same as it has been for 2,000 years. The question is, will you accept it? Paul said, who is equal to such a task? Today I encourage you that the mission is possible when you are willing to become all things to all people so that by all possible means you might save some. I don't know where you are with your walk in Christ, but if you are here and have accepted Jesus as your Savior, you can't accept the mission if you haven't accepted Him. There is no mission without Him. The mission is all about Jesus. If you've been sitting here today, and despite everything going on in your life, you realize that you are in need of a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus, I assure you there is salvation here today. And I want to give you the opportunity today to accept Him as your Savior. There's no bigger decision you'll make in your life than to follow Jesus. If that's you today and you're here, I know Pastor Barbara during the, the worship today, she, she felt and I felt my spirit too, there's somebody here that God has been calling. And if that's you, I want to just take a few minutes before we do anything else and I want to give you that opportunity. So if that's you, just raise your hand or you can come up here. If that is you, I want you to come up here. We're going to pray with you as a church. Anybody else want to join up here? Church, let's pray. Church, I'm going to ask you to pray with us, all right? Dear Lord, I love you. In need of a savior. I know you died on the cross for my sins. And today I acknowledge you. I know you rose again and that you have forgiven my sins. I believe in you and I confess today that I need you. Come into my life. Jesus, I love you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, church. Can we look at this? All of heaven is rejoicing in one except him. Amen. is so real for me. Everyone was joking. They said I wore my business suit today. <laughs> I do mean business because this is real. And I don't ever want to get up here and pretend that like, oh, this is easy. I know I gave you guys a hard sermon today. But it's real. It's the truth. And I assure you that I don't live my way that, oh, we're all happy, and it's easy. In fact, just this week, I received a call from my sister. And church, if you have a family member that has addiction, there's nothing worse there's nothing harder because there's boundaries that you have to live with but there's also showing the love of Jesus so I know what it feels like to have family members that are far from God when we sing this song when we sang this song this morning about 
In fact, I can tell you Thanksgiving morning as I was preparing our Thanksgiving meal, my sister was heavy on my heart and on my mind, and this song was what came up. Because I speak Jesus in her life. I don't know any other way but to speak Jesus in her life. I speak Jesus in my, the life of my family, and that is what we have to do, church. We may not be able to... I'm not saying go to them and preach a sermon. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying love them. I'm saying be there. Be the open door for those that are far from God in our lives. And always point the direction to Him. To become all things to all people so that by all possible means you might save some. Not you, but He might save them. Amen? Will you stand with me today? and you realize that you have missed the most important mission field, your home. You can answer that call today. Parents, you can become intentional and instrumental in leading your children to Christ. Don't give up. Don't give in. Fight the battle for them until they are able to fight themselves. If you are here today and you have good intentions to live a life on mission, but you have failed for lack of plenty, planning and discipline in your own life. Today, that can change. You can change. It's just you and God. He is able if you are willing. And if you are here today and you have counted the cost, and maybe in the past you believed it to be too much, but today you realize there is so much more. You can lay it down at His feet. You can lay the hurt down at His feet. Church hurt keeps you from answering the call. Remember this. Nobody was hurt more from the church than Jesus. Amen. And He still went willingly to the cross for you. You can only see the cost, but He sees all of eternity. And if you are here today and you realize you have been lulled to sleep by the comforts of this world, you have been too busy to be concerned. You've been comfortable and cozy, but now you realize there is an urgency to the mission. And there is no day like today to make the change. Church, if any of those are you, would you raise your hand today and just say, Lord, help me to answer the call. Answer the call of the mission you've set before us, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray today for each and every person here, Lord Jesus. Father, Lord, that they would hear the call that you have for them, Lord. Each of us have specific people in our lives, Father, that only we can minister to or reach, Lord. Help us, Father. Lord, help us to realize the urgency, Father. Lord, help us to count the cost, Lord. Help us to be disciplined and to plan, Father, Lord Jesus, and to be intentional to those that we may meet, Father, Lord. Lord, I pray right now, Father, Lord Jesus, for each and every person that is here today, Father, Lord. I pray that you would encourage them, Father, Lord. I pray that they would walk out of these doors, Father, and, Father, Lord, that they would be intentional in the steps that they take, Father. Lord, I pray that they would not leave here, Lord, and live their life the same way. But, Father, that they would change, Father, Lord, in ways that you have called them to change. <laughs> Lord, we love you and we thank you today. If you fell into any of those categories, I want to still have prayer with you. But I want to encourage you to share with someone in your life or in this room what steps God is calling you to. You see, there's something about sharing. It produces accountability. I know we do not like that word. But when you share, it makes you accountable. Because once you say it, then it's kind of like, oh, I better do it. So if you're answering the call today to lead a life of mission in your home or wherever, in your workplace, then I want you to share what you're going to do. I'm going to give you some examples. Let's say you're going to lead a life of mission in your home with your children, and you're going to start leading nightly devotions with your kids. Share that with someone. If you are answering the call to give monthly 
lead the missions. You know you can't go, but you can give. You're going to go fill out a faith pledge card, and we're going to have them in the back. So if you haven't done so, make sure you fill out your faith pledge card this month. But you're going to fill that out. And then you're going to tell someone that you're going to start giving to missions monthly. If you know that you need to be more disciplined in your life, you have failed to read the word or to pray, and now you're going to make the commitment to be more disciplined, share that with someone. I'll be in the back. You can share it with me. But I encourage you to share that with someone. Let church, let us support each other. Let's live a life on mission together. Let's be the team of mission possible. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask our worship team if they'll sing. I speak Jesus as we leave today. And I want to ask each of you that you would just sing this as your anthem. I mean, this song is so powerful. But what's powerful is the name of Jesus. Amen? And our prayer team is going to be up here. If anyone would like specific prayer, we'll pray with you. But I ask that you would just sing this and sing it like you mean it today. Thank you.
Lord, use each and every one of us on mission for you. Lord, we love you and we thank you today. Father, Lord, seal this in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.